Hello, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to Impact Cyber Church, where you're going to church with people all over the world right now. And people all over the world like you are changing the way they see God. And you say, well, why don't I want to change the way I see God? Because I'm going to tell you something. When we see God as He really is, the way Jesus came and presented Him, I'm telling you something. We, we, we can connect to the promises. We can trust Him. We'll follow Him. We'll obey Him. I mean, it, it brings an end to all of our struggles. And, you know, we've been talking about dignity and worth for the last last four weeks. And you know what? I'm just not going to stop. I just feel like there's more that we've got to cover. And today I want to talk to you about the cleansing blood. Now I'm going to tell you, this is powerful because I think you're going to have some insights into the blood of Jesus and ways to literally, the Bible tells us about activating the blood of Jesus and activating our faith. And I know that just sounds kind of crazy, but you know what? It's not. And I'm telling you, you're going to get some life transforming stuff for the cleansing blood of Jesus. I'll be right back. You know, I've got a great free message for you this month called Seeing Yourself as God Sees You. There are few things that will transform your life as much as coming to understand and believe how God really sees and feels about you. Be sure and download this. It's a life changer. Listen, I just want to review just a little bit about dignity and worth and why this is so incredibly important. You know, the deepest need, internal need that you have, the deepest need that you have that will affect everything about your life is to be loved. The greatest need that you have to express yourself in this world that produces life is to have a sense of dignity and worth. And dignity and worth comes directly from knowing, experiencing, feeling, believing the love of God. And let's just, let's just talk about the importance of this. Remember, God crowned man with glory. Glory and honor, and that, those were glory and honor. They actually could be interpreted a lot of different ways, but among the many ways they can be interpreted or translated is dignity and worth. You see, when God gave man authority over the world, he first crowned him with dignity and worth. And because man knew who he was in relationship to his creator, he knew who he was in relationship to his God. And, and until he believed the lie that he wasn't who God said he was, he had complete confidence and ruled the world. I want to tell you something. Man still has authority to rule the world, but because man doesn't have dignity and worth, then what happens in the world, the way he expresses that authority comes out in corruption. It comes out in death. It comes out in destruction. But when you've got dignity and worth, I'll tell you, you use your authority, you have confidence, and you can walk in who you are in Jesus. Now, also, dignity and worth, our, sen our sense of self-worth, directs every single decision that we're ever going to make. Now, if you haven't had a chance to listen to the previous four programs, you might want to go back and listen to them, particularly where we talk about the internal hierarchy, where identity, self-image, self-worth, and self-confidence forms the matrix around which every decision that you're ever going to make is going to be made out of how you relate to yourself in those areas, identity, self-worth, identity, self-image, self-worth, and self-confidence. And you'll say yes or no to opportunity based on those factors. You'll say yes or no to a great uh, a relationship based on those factors. You'll choose the wrong job, choose the right job based on those factors. Every decision that you're ever going to make is going to be determined by this internal hierarchy. So really our dignity and worth of them actually determines the quality of our life. People who don't have a sense of dignity and worth, they, they always take shortcuts. They always, they, they feel like they're not worthy. They feel like, they, they feel like they've got to cheat to get ahead. They feel like they've got to lie to get ahead or exaggerate to get ahead. They've got to do something to compensate for, for the lack of self-worth. I want to tell you something. When you have self-worth that comes from uh, knowing who you are in Jesus, knowing who you are to the Father. I got news for you. You don't have to compensate. You don't have to put on airs. You don't have to wear a mask. You don't even have, you, you won't even ever worry about what anybody else thinks about you or says about you because you'll absolutely know who you are. Now, I want you to understand something. Religion, and religion is the spiritual counterfeit for relationship by faith. And religion wants you to be moved and motivated by guilt. 
And that's why so many preachers, even though they're good men and women, you know, they're, it's not that they're trying to do the wrong thing. They're just doing what they know. So many preachers try to get you to live a godly life simply by guilt or by fear. Now, I want to tell you something. When you do the right thing, but you're being motivated by fear or guilt, you still never get the outcome that you hope to have. Because every seed bears after its own kind. And the seed that's in your heart, the, 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 the thing that you consider to be the truth that drives your life is what produces fruit in your life. It's not just what you do. It's what you do and the reason you do it, the intention that you have behind it. So religion wants you to be motivated by fear and guilt. And you never, ever, ever get out of it what, you, what you're promised and what you think you're going to get out of it. But Jesus want you to be motivated by love and compassion. And I'll tell you what, the two cannot coexist. Fear and love cannot coexist. Guilt and compassion can't, they, they, don't, they just don't coexist because guilt's all about me. It's not about compassion for somebody else. Now, one of the things that we've learned is we've learned a little bit about the conscience and the value of the conscience. The last program, we talked a lot about the conscience. Now, remember that the heart is both spirit and soul. It's where the spirit and soul come together to make the real you, the entire you. So you're not just spirit and you're not just soul. Uh, actually, before man fell and became flesh, he was a, a living soul. In other words, he was a soul that was dominated by the life of God. Then, whenever he alienated himself from God, he became flesh. In other words, his soul now became dominated by his, his desires by, by these five senses and the need to satisfy them and the need to interpret life by these five senses. Now, when the, the, all of the Word of God, all of God's truth has been written, written in the deepest part of our heart, which is in our spirit. So all of the commandments of God, but all of the motives and intentions behind those commandments have been written the deepest part of your being. And the motive and the intention is always love. It's never anything else. It's never legalism. It's never, it's never earning something from God. It's, ne you know, it's none of those sick and twisted things. It's always about how to walk in love. So then in our soul, we have our intellectual and conscious mind, conscious thoughts. And, and, in, and, and this is the part that the Bible tells us we have to renew. We have to renew our mind. We have to change our thinking to harmonize with what is intuitively coming out of the deepest part of our being. Now, these two these two aspects, what God is saying from your spirit and what your mind is saying from your soul, create a co-perception. That's what the word conscious means. It's a co-perception. It's two people. It's like two people looking at the same thing and, of course, interpreting it possibly different. So the voice of your heart is, in fact, your conscience. And this means that your ability to hear God clearly your ability to see yourself, perceive yourself clearly. Your ability to, to evaluate what's going on in the world around you. Uh, you know, the threats, the opportunities, the challenges. The ability to see all these things clearly is dependent on you having a whole, healthy, single eye, if you will. And that's what Jesus said. If your eye be single, and this is what he's talking about, the way you perceive things. If you look at it, and, and, and you've got your mind renewed in line with the Word of God, then you're going to see it the way God sees it, and you're going to make decisions though out of God's wisdom and out of God's strength, and God's power is going to manifest in your life. So, so the determining factor in being able to receive what God has freely given us in Jesus is rooted in our conscience. You know, you know I understand the role that faith plays, and faith is the ability to trust, but you've got to understand something. Many times... The reason we don't trust God has nothing, may have nothing to do with, with God. It may have to do with how we feel about ourselves. That's why the Apostle John warned us that when we violate our conscience, we don't have confidence before God when our heart condemns us. And when we don't have confidence before God, we can't receive. We can't take hold of what God is offering us freely because of the way that we feel about ourselves. But today I want to dive into the role that the blood of Jesus plays in cleansing our conscience. Now, this is crucial. You see, most people only think of the blood of Jesus when connecting it to 
uh, being, you know, being washed, our sins being washed away, or, you know, being born again. But the truth is there's far more to it than that. Now, that is important, and I don't by any means want to minimize that, but I want you to realize something. If you only relate to and think of the blood of Jesus as what a, this one-time act back here that got you uh, born again and got your, you forgiven of your sins, then you're going to be missing out on one of the key factors that makes living a victorious, faith-filled, overcomer's life. You're going to be missed out on it because, because the blood of Jesus is crucial. It is the most crucial aspect for cleansing our conscience. So listen, I'll be back in just a minute. Don't go away. Man, this is going to turn your world right side up. Listen, if you're tired of feeling bad about yourself, if you're tired of, of not liking who you are, and you're tired of the way that's affecting your relationships and your walk with God, then you want to get my series, Dignity and Worth, a 10 CD series with two bonus CDs, which means you're going to get 12 uh, CDs, two of them are going to be a free gift to you because I want to invest in you. And I want to tell you, this is going to give you the tools you need to walk through a life transformation and change your sense of dignity and worth. All right, we're going to be talking about how the blood of Jesus relates to having a clean, clear conscience. Now, remember, we know and we understand the fact that we were washed by the blood when we came to Jesus. Listen to the scripture in Acts 20, 28. It says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So, you know, we understand we were purchased by his blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, <clears throat> there is a, an argument that is going on kind of out in the world today that says there is no need to ever seek for forgiveness or to confess your sins because it's true, all of our sins were forgiven when Jesus died on the cross. But <clears throat> what people are failing to understand is, there, see, the word forgiven means to send away. So it's one thing for God to send our sins away from him so that he is not affected. Our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. God is never looking at us through the filter or through the lens of our failings or our shortcomings. But the problem is we are looking at God through the filter of our shortcomings and failings unless our conscience has been cleansed. Because even when you do something, when you do something you know you shouldn't do and you look clearly in the Bible and you, and you see God's forgiveness there for whatever it is that you've done, the question is not, did God send that sin away from him? The question is, have you sent that sin or that guilt as a result of that sin away from you? And so we've taken something that is true, which is that all of our sins are forgiven when we're saved, and we've really misunderstood and overlooked scriptures that talk about the role that the blood plays in our clear conscience. But I want to talk about a couple of other things, and this is why, and we need to understand this. You see, blood always represents wrath and judgment. And this is very important because in order to really fall in love with Jesus, it's all going to revolve around, according to the Apostle John, what we believe about what the Bible calls the propitiation, the satisfying of wrath. Now, God made a covenant of peace with Jesus. And, and if we believe in the Lord Jesus and we are in him, we have believed into him, we are in him, and we are sharing in the covenant that God has made. And this covenant is called the covenant of peace. Now, many people are saying that God really didn't pour his wrath out on Jesus because since God's love, he can't have any wrath. Well, let me tell you something. We don't have the right to define love. We don't have the right to shape and mold an image of God out of our own imagination. We have to take what the Bible says and like it or not, understand it or not, we just have to realize, you know something, God is love and I may not understand, I may not understand this right now, but, but I'm going to trust myself to God and I will understand it 
at some time in the future. Now, if God had not poured all of his wrath literally on Jesus for our sins, then there would have been no need to make a covenant of peace and, and make this promise to Jesus that he would never pour his wrath on him again. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand something. God had to deal with the sin issue to make it legally possible and to make it spiritually possible for us to have a clear conscience before God. Now listen to this. Romans 3.25 talks about Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. Now again, the word propitiation means the appeasing or the satisfying of wrath. And there are, again, many people saying that's not what that word means. But even if you don't think that's what that word means, what do you do with the dozens, if not hundreds, of scriptures that talk about what Jesus went through on the cross and in his death and in his, and in his resurrection? So it says, it says, God set him forth, set forth Jesus as a propitiation. How? By his blood. So by his blood, by his sacrificing, then our sins were paid for. His wrath toward us was satisfied. And it says through faith. So we participate. Jesus was raised from the dead by faith. And we know that. But we participate in this by our faith. It says to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, there's several things in that scripture I want to just hit on real quick. Like, first, I want to realize righteousness had to be fulfilled. And the fact that God is a righteous God, he would have denied himself and become a liar if he had totally done nothing about our sins and just said, okay, see, I, I'm just going to overlook it. Well, in the Old Testament, God overlooked people's sins. In the Old Testament, uh, they, didn't, they didn't truly get forgiveness. Uh, you know, uh, 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 their sins were rolled forward from year to year to year until Jesus could come and pay for their sins for them. So God has established all things based on truth, based on righteousness, based really on, on order that evidently is, is just beyond the logic of many people who have a need to see uh, God or define God in some way that makes them feel more comfortable. Let, let me tell you, most of the time when people uh, redefine God and redefine God's word, they have a conscience that's not clear. They have a need to, to not have fear. They have a need to be comfortable. They have a need to be at peace. And they just can't take what the Bible says the way it says it and trust God in the thing. So they have to recreate, they have to twist scriptures and recreate their image of God so that they can feel comfortable because, in fact, they don't really trust what God's Word says and what Jesus really did. Colossians 1, 19, 20 says, For it pleased the Father that in Him... All the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, where the things on earth are things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So, peace was made at the cross. This was just not imaginary. If there was an enmity between God and man, then there would have been no need for him to make peace. And like I said, righteousness requires that the price for everything be paid. But keep in mind, mercy and love desires that man never have to pay that price. So God had this dilemma. He had to meet the legal requirements of his truth, but he had to do it in a way that portrayed love and mercy to all mankind. Now let's look at the blood of Jesus and a clear conscience. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 7, says this. It says, but into the second part, the high priest, talking about the second part of the temple, went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So, so there, was a, there was a symbol of the tabernacle that Moses would go into carrying the blood of these sacrifices. But as long as that was standing, it was giving testimony to the fact that the, the way into the true holiest of all had never been opened. Well, now, and by the blood of Jesus, it has been opened. But verse 9 says this, It was symbolic 
for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices uh, are offered, which cannot make him who performed the services perfect. Now, normally, for years and years and years, when I read that scripture, I just stopped there. And so I just stopped at the whole concept of the, the, those sacrifices couldn't make the comers there into perfect. So, so the sacrifice that Jesus gave us did make us perfect. Now that word perfect means whole or complete. We'll look at some other meanings in just a minute. But while that is true, because our spirit man has been made perfect, it doesn't stop there because that scripture is not talking about the spirit man because it goes on to say that it could not make those who perform the sacrifices perfect in regard to their conscience. This is not talking about their spirit. It's talking about their conscience, their ability to see God, to see themselves, to perceive life as it should be. So that, so that word perfect, of course, means to, to make something or to put something into effect. So this is really important. You see, we have to put the blood of Jesus into effect in our conscience, first and foremost, by believing the truth, believing that God has satisfied all of his wrath in Jesus and we never have any reason to fear. So even though the blood of Jesus has already paid for our sins and has already sent them away from God, and that's what forgiveness means, the truth is, by our faith, we have to put that in effect so that the guilt about our sins leaves us. It has no power on us. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Jesus which we take hold of by faith, has the ability to, to, to give us this sense of completeness, of perfection, of righteousness that frees us from this legalistic cycle of getting into dead works and feeling like we've got to do things to earn being righteous, to earn things from God. But this is all about something that happens in your conscience, not just something that happened when God forgave your sins. See, it happens in us when we forgive us of our sins, when we send our sins away. So our spirit has been made clean by the blood of Jesus. But our conscience has to be cleansed today by the blood of Jesus. And again, if there was no need to restore our connection uh, to the blood of Jesus, we would not have the cer ceremony of communion. Stop and think about it. communion is where we re-engage and reactivate. We don't activate the blood of Jesus as far as on God's side of it, but on our side, we activate the blood in our lives because when we operate faith, then it starts to come alive to us. And the Bible talks about activating our faith. So, so I want you to understand something. We are tending to miss the majority of what God offers us in the blood of Jesus because we don't see the value that the blood of Jesus has in cleansing our conscience. We don't even see the value of having a clean conscience in most cases. But when your conscience is clear and when you, when you are absolutely sure and immovable and know and feel and believe and sense and all of your emotions are rooted in the fact that not only are all of your sins forgiven, but, but you, are, you are before God righteous, washed, cleansed. When that is your reality, I want to tell you something. You, you, you pray in faith and something happens. You speak words and something happens. You bind and loose and something happens because con confidence is an absolute essential for real faith to work in your life. Don't go away. I'll be back with a mentoring moment in just one minute. You know, if this is speaking to your heart, man, if you're getting stirred up to feel better about yourself right now, go online and you can download this series, Dignity and Worth, and you can begin making your transformation today. Don't wait another minute.
You know, I want to encourage you to check out our new website. If you haven't looked around our website in a while, we've got a new website, and I'm telling you what, I'm so excited about it. It works so much more effectively. It's so much more attractive, and we are just delighted to be able to offer more tools. As a matter of fact, when you go to our website, even if you've been there a bunch of times, go to the welcome page and look at all of the things that are that are listed there about where to start. One of the most important things on that welcome page is where to get started. And if you've got people that you're ministering to and you're trying to disciple them, they're new believers, you're trying to lead them into water baptism, you're trying to instruct them about communion, you're trying to lead them to Jesus, then you can go in there and you can click on a link and you can sit right down there with your friends and you can walk them through the same personal mentoring that I have used almost all of my ministry life and it would be it would be the same as them sitting here me and you and them sitting here together mentor your friends on our website I don't want to just share very quickly a little exercise that I do quite often I, I do this when I'm when I need to get healed I do this when I'm dealing with some emotional issues I do this when I'm, when I, when I'm just trying to sort some things out see we need to learn to take everything back to the cross of Christ the death burial and resurrection of Jesus so I, I want you to sit down and I want you, if there's some things that maybe you have some twinges of guilt about or maybe some things that you wake up in the night and you remember your past and, and you struggle with this and you, it, it's still kind of hanging over your head. Then first I want you to go back and, and, and well, I want you to make a list of, of, of some of these emotions that you're feeling. They don't have to worry about what you did. It's just how, how do you feel? And then I want you to go back and, and watch the program again and write down some of these scriptures that tell us what we have by the blood of Jesus. And, and, and maybe even make, write down some comments about what these scriptures mean based on what I was sharing with you about them. And then I want you to go one by one through each one of those things. And I want you to, I want you to ask yourself a question. Did Jesus do anything about this particular sin or this particular failure that's causing this emotion? Did he do anything about it on his cross through his death, burial, and resurrection? Did he take the punishment for this? Did he overcome this when he was raised from the dead? If the answer is yes to that, then you want to ask yourself another question is if Jesus overcame this and Jesus paid the price for this, is there any reason that I should continue to hold on to it? No. And then that's when you speak to that emotion, whatever it is, guilt, shame, or, or, or failure, whatever it is, you speak to it and, and just guilt, shame, right now in the name of Jesus, I say, I don't want you, I don't need you, you're not from God. I choose to believe the truth about what Jesus did for me through his death, burial, and resurrection, and I send you away, I don't want you anymore. And then just spend a little bit of time just worshiping God and work through your list until you have a clear conscience.